Now then, my name is Ryan Central, and after playing Borderlands 3 at the gameplay reveal and also speaking to some of the devs, there are a few new things to the Borderlands series that were added that I think will really make Borderlands 3 an exceptional game. Some of the stuff we got to experience firsthand playing the demo, but some of these things were teased and hinted at by the devs in said interviews. In this video, I'm going to go over the top 10 features and new stuff that will make Borderlands 3 an absolutely incredible game. I'm not saying it's going to be the best game in the world, but with these key changes from the Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel, we may have the best Borderlands game yet. Just as a quick FYI, we have a giveaway going on at the moment, and again, sorry for the audio quality of some of the interviews in here. The first area that I wanted to talk about is the tone of Borderlands 3. Borderlands 1 and 2 were very different in their tone and almost style of humour and a sense of seriousness. Borderlands 1 was very dry and dark, whereas Borderlands 2, whilst it had some serious dark moments, was a bit more zany, and the only way that I could describe it is Uwu XD. Borderlands 3's tone was set perfectly between them, and that was a conscious decision coming from the Gearbox developers, at least from level designer Kate Pitstick. Um, so we wanted to land somewhere between, Borderlands 1 was known for being like super dark and gritty, and then Borderlands 2 was a lot more uh, internet memes and the hilarity and just that irreverence. So for three, the main focus has been, okay, how do we have a nice in-between mix where we can still have the, you know, the wild, funny things that Borderlands 2 is really well known for, but getting into some of the darker themes and tones that uh, harken back to Borderlands 1. Sure. Here's a really good example of what we experienced with this system. One quest has you trying to get coffee for Lorelei, who is a new character, as if it's a life or death mission. Very much could have been taken out of the Borderlands 2 tone, whereas another mission that we got to experience has you getting revenge on some Maliwan soldiers who killed your quest giver's family. Both soldiers are arguing that they were the one that killed the family and they are the real bad guy, and then you have to decide which one that you want to kill. Well hey, did that stupid Sam tell you I killed their family? When you go back to hand in that quest, the quest giver will say it was probably the other guy that you didn't kill. In which case you can either hand in a quest and leave it, in which case the quest giver gets kind of upset at you, or you can go back and kill the other one. This kind of quest is very much a Borderlands 1 kind of thing. No doubt there's even more examples of this happening in the game, but so far we've seen a complete hybrid of Borderlands 1's very dark, dry humour, with a little bit of silly straight out of Borderlands 2. The second area is builds. Borderlands has certainly learnt a lot with how they construct characters, the RPG elements and the builds that they create. There's a few major things that are missing or changed which I'm super excited about. The first is that there's no specific weapon talents. There's no increased shotgun damage, increased sniper rifle damage, talents that you have to get if you're running specific weapons in order to get the most out of them. And also with elements, there's no talents such as increase acid damage specifically. There are talents for Zane such as refreshment, where if you damage a frozen target, you get back some of that damage's health. So there are talents based around certain elements, but none that flat out increase the damage with cryo or fire or pistols, shotguns, etc. There are some one talent wonders in the normal skill tree, but the most interesting ones are known as augments. These are typically to the sides of the talent tree, which you can see on screen, and they don't cost talent points, but you can only equip a certain amount to each ability if you're playing Zane, but do remember that Zane as a character can have two abilities equipped at once. So two augments on each ability giving you four augments total. But for Amara, it requires you to line up the augment shapes with the shape in her ability slot shown. You have the arrows, the hexagons and the diamonds, and you can only equip the square pegs in the square holes, if that makes sense. These augments could do things like changing the element of your ability to cryo or radiation, having your abilities fire additional missiles or extra charges, really changing how these normal abilities can work. And because of this, the talent tree is a lot more exciting and less focused on picking specific talents based on what weapons that you like to use what elements you end up using, you know how it works, you end up getting stuck in like an assault rifle build 
so if you get a good rocket launcher, you can't really use it as well. But there's another positive to this which we'll go over in the next section, which is guns. The good thing about guns is that the system hasn't changed too much, but like abilities, some things were taken out and added in that give it a significant quality of life improvement. The first example of that are gear scores. This is a quickfire way to allow you to see which weapon out of two or three is objectively better. Sometimes it can be really awkward to work out uh, between different weapon types, damage numbers, fire rates, which weapon is better when you're deciding between them. But the gear score allows you easily to see weapon A is better than weapon B. However, don't be too worried because gear score has no other meaning or effect in the game other than what I just mentioned. No content will be locked out because you don't have a high enough gear score. So other than being able to show you the difference in weapon power, it doesn't have any effective use in the game. Getting back to the manufacturers and types, they are significantly more vast in the game and a lot more distinct. Borderlands 2 had some manufacturers that were more distinct than others. However, in Borderlands 3, they really stepped up their game and each manufacturer feels incredibly unique. You have the crazy characteristics of TDR, throwing a gun on the ground has it sprout legs and chase after enemies, but you also have examples of alternate fire modes on guns such as Dahl, Vladov, Malawan, Torg, and a couple more that I haven't mentioned. For Vladov, you could change with your alternate fire a gun from an assault rifle into a grenade launcher. For Dahl, with the alternate fire, you could change different fire rates, from automatic to semi-automatic, from semi-automatic to a free burst fire. Maliwan can change elements from fire to radiation, as an example. A Torg changes from detonating on impact shots to sticky grenades that do more damage if you line them up together. The alternate fire for all of these weapons that I just mentioned gives it so much more character. Like I mentioned with the Talents 2, there's no make X weapon better, there's no make shotguns better or anything like that, which means that you could swap out weapons a lot more consistently and a lot more comfortably. No matter if you're picking up a shotgun at endgame versus playing through the game with one, it will still perform just as well. There's no weapon proficiency or anything like that, which makes it so much easier to swap out different kinds of weapons without worrying with how it'll perform, which I think is a really big bonus. Number four is characters. We only got to experience two of the four Vault Hunters from the gameplay event, but what we experienced was so much more than what we expected. One of the major things that Gearbox has learned from in previous titles is that players want our Vault Hunters to talk more. In Borderlands 1 and 2, we were kind of the silent assassin. All we got mostly was an evil laugh now and again, or a scream. But in pre-sequel, our characters chatted amongst themselves and responded to quest conversations. This is back in a big way for Borderlands 3, and the way that our characters answer back to NPCs really gives us a shine to their personalities of what they're like. And as I said, this was very much intentional from Gearbox. One of the biggest things of uh, player feedback we got was they wanted to have more of the, the player's interaction, the player character's interaction. So having the characters answer NPCs or acknowledge the world around them or like ask questions about like, why am I doing this? Why can't I do this right now? Um, and finding a, a natural way to, to fit that into the environment and into the story. Instead of just being like the silent sort of Right, yeah, yeah. One prime example of this is Zane, who is the sort of assassin character. His Irish Man Sweeney charm really added a lot to the character. It added new information that we'd never know otherwise, such as the fact that he knows Zero and how he would murder a pint if he could get one. Amaru was less exciting with her dialogue, but it does really give you a good insight to how serious she is and her character as a whole. I really cannot wait to see how Flack and Mo sound and what their personalities are like. It might just make me want to play these characters when the game actually comes out in September. Five is the new looter shooter elements. It's a huge factor when it comes to the grand scheme of Borderlands, and it's Borderlands as a new looter shooter. During the time between Borderlands 2 and now, we've had two Destinies, two Divisions, an Anthem, a Warframe, and much more in this genre. And it all came from this franchise of games. But now that the third installment is coming back, how does it intend to evolve the genre, if at all? How possible is that? Well, again, Gearbox said that they're moving with the genre, but ultimately, this game is still a Borderlands game. And one of the, the biggest things has been, like, people wondering with how the looter-shooter genre has evolved, you know, what are we doing? 
And really, what we are trying to do is stay true to what the original games were. Um, we're not trying to do the microtransactions or the always online things or the the shared world shooters, I guess they're called now. Um, we've really been trying to focus on, okay, how does this play on couch co-op? You know, is it still fun to play offline as it is to play uh, online with another friend? Um, and focusing on classic Borderlands details like that. Um, looking at how they did very basic uh, character narrative interactions or um, repeatable missions, like figuring out what other games were doing well and what what we could borrow from those that would still make sense within our game. Like one of, one of the pitfalls I think happens with certain other games is that they'll see other games that are succeeding and take bits and pieces of that and fit it into their narrative, but it doesn't fit well. Right. Um, so really trying to find the, a good balance of what makes sense to borrow from these other titles that, that works with us. I felt that this was important to highlight as it would be easy for Gearbox to go down the MMO light, always online shared world experience because that's what's most popular. And to an extent, I do hope that there's some elements from these games that will end up in Borderlands 3. Not major stuff, just stuff like matchmaking for certain activities for those that want to group up. But you heard it from the horse's mouth, they want to evolve Borderlands 3 into the new generation of looter shooters, but at the end of the day, it's still Borderlands. Number 6 is the locations, or I guess more specifically, the worlds. Borderlands allows us to travel to different planets the first time in this franchise, and this is in our search for more vaults. We do this via the Spaceship Sanctuary 3, and quite easily we can fly from places like Pandora to Promethea and beyond. Not only that, the worlds themselves are quite massive. We got to spend a lot of time on Promethea during the demo, and the world seems so much more dynamic and alive than anything that we've experienced so far. It feels much more like a hub world in Destiny than anything else, but in a good way. Instead of running from one side of the map to another and then back again, everything feels well placed. Being able to travel around in a vehicle and use new use stations to travel around also makes this super fun. The four hours I got to play running around Promethea absolutely flew by, and this was just two map sections in a much bigger world with plenty more to check out. It's fair to say that Borderlands is going to be massive in comparison to the other titles that we've played in the past. Next up is NPCs and other characters that you get to experience, and I do think that this is quite a big area. I was quite worried with the size of the Borderlands cast already that new enemies such as the Calypso Twins and new allies such as Lorelei would be overshadowed by the cast that we have already, but I found both sets of characters really entertaining and they immediately displayed their personality and characteristics. That's not all though, in addition to the old characters like Reese from Tales and Zero, their addition to the story was well timed, they weren't overly involved but still a lot of fun to encounter these characters and be able to speak to them. Another thing worth highlighting is that these NPCs that I just mentioned are able to join you out in the world now and again. You will fight alongside Lorelei and Zero in the demo in some cases, and they will definitely have your back. Not to mention that if you get downed, they, along with other Atlas soldiers that may be stood around or other allies in the game, they can revive you if you crawl to them. I also asked boss designer Matt Cox, if this was an intentional way to make solo play less isolating, and this was his answer. That is, that is almost exactly one of my goals with NPCs. On, on one hand, Borderlands is all about being able to explore on your own terms, so we didn't want to tether the, the NPCs all the time to you, but at the same time, we wanted to feel their presence being more significant and like, oh, they're actually doing stuff. And like Lilith, like finding that balance of Lilith was a previous Vault Hunter, so we expect her to do a bunch of badass things, but at the same time, we don't want her to pull a agency away from the player. But she's only there for, I mean, you know, that particular combat. So yes, that was a goal. And I love playing through the, uh, every game by myself the first time. Like I will play through Borderlands 2 by myself, no co-op. So it was a, a goal to make sure that the player didn't feel, even though they were playing solo, they didn't feel alone. And as we just spoke to Matt Cox, who again is the lead boss designer, let's talk bosses for the next spot. Bosses are a key part in any looter shooter game, and it's said that Borderlands 3 will have more bosses by a landslide than any other Borderlands game. Some will be mini bosses like Gigamind and Mouthpiece, 
but some are going to have some pretty difficult mechanics. Mechanics that if you do wrong, will get you killed instantly. Uh, I will say with certain battles, you'll definitely have more, uh, you can make more fatal mistakes, yeah, against some certain bosses. We would, I don't think we'd want to do that with every single boss encounter because then it might just get uh, frustrating. But yes, you, you will see new things you probably didn't expect to happen while you're playing and you have to learn something new in order to beat the boss. I also asked if we as YouTubers would be able to make boss guides with the amount of mechanics that they may have and Matt Cox said yeah. So not only does it seem that more bosses will be in Borderlands 3, but some of them may require a bit more know-how with the mechanics to be able to beat them. But all of that is irrelevant when it comes to our penultimate thing, loot. Loot is such a pivotal part of any looter shooter game. I mean, it's in the name of it, right? Looter shooter. But Borderlands manages to get everything right with their system. Not only does every boss drop a huge amount of loot, but it's also likely that you'll get a legendary weapon from each major encounter. Usually the weapon that the boss is using. It's a cool way to reward you through the process to collect rare weapons. Rather than wait until the end game, you can get them as you go along. Other loot changes are quite significant too. An example of that would be the new loot level instancing system that you can use in groups. In this new system, you as a level 5 could group up with your mum, who's actually rushed ahead to level 25, and still be able to play together. They will be synced to your game and level, so they don't just tank and spank, one shot everything. They will play alongside you at the same difficulty. But not only that, they will get guns and gear scaled to their level of 25. This system will make playing Borderlands with others so much easier and so much more fun. There's no, oh, I gotta catch up with you guys if I wanna play with you, or anything like that. This whole system will make playing with your mum, who is so much better at the game than you, a whole lot more easier and a whole lot more fun. And finally, we reach the end, number 10, which we go over end game. It's safe to say that we don't know an awful lot about what happens at max level in Borderlands 3, but what we do know is super exciting. Borderlands 2 has a fairly expansive end game that still has people logging in five years on. Basically, if you enjoy the end game of Borderlands 2, you will love the end game in Borderlands 3, at least from what I've heard. But the devs have also been watching how the community has made their own end game with events such as The Hunt, and they do have more stuff to share fairly soon. Especially after watching Twitch and seeing the people who had, had been constantly streaming, you know, since Portalance 2 had launched or since uh, the pre sequel had launched, uh, and them developing their own community events around in game content, coming up with their huge Excel sheet of, for the hunt of, okay, yeah, yeah. this is how many points that you'll get if you get this or that. Um, we've definitely taken an account in game and post launch content. Uh, hopefully, around closer to September 13th and definitely at E3, we'll be able to share a little bit more about that. Okay, cool. Endgame, like loot, is another important element of the Loot Shooter series. It's an area that wants to keep you playing 500 hours into the game, and it's super important that Gearbox get that right. With that said, however, it seems that they're more than prepared to give us the end game that we really desire. The whole point of this video was to really show you the stuff that's got me really excited about Borderlands 3 and how it really intends to improve not only the franchise of Borderlands games, but the loot shooter genre as a whole. Recently, we've had a lot of disappointments there, so I'm really excited what Borderlands could do to really shape it up and to get people to see how it's supposed to be done. But that's everything that I wanted to go over today. As I said, we have a giveaway going on in the comments below for you to check out. Be sure to enter. Thanks again for watching. Subscribe for more Borderlands content. And until next time, take care. We'll see you then.